Hello again. This is part two of our short series on the HP 9845. Our last video introduced this, well, what you might call an early workstation. Have a watch of that if you've not already seen it. In this video, we'll dig into the system to see what makes it tick. This 9845 was made in 1980. HP manufactured these systems in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, Berlingham, Germany, and Japan. It was the product of a project team led by Bill Eads and Jack Walden. Bob Brooks was the lead engineer. The industrial design was led by Steve Anderson. There were something like a hundred people involved in the system's birth. Let's start with the story of the case itself. It's got a lot to pack in. There are tape drives, a printer, ROM drawers, two card cages, a pluggable bus, a big old power supply, and this is all topped off by a monitor with an embedded graphics controller. This machine is an example of careful thermal engineering. There are dual airflow channels, one through each side of the machine, and yes, indeed, it does generate some heat. The tight packing of components led the mechanical engineer, Lee White, to do quite a lot of work on thermal and airflow studies. And yet, it is also, at least for a fan-driven system from 1980, a quiet system. Howling fans would not have worked in an office environment, and this machine needs to fit in there. Now let's crack the covers on the Sparrows machine and have a look at the system architecture. With a monitor off, there are four screws holding this back cover on. It lifts straight up and off. Inside, you can immediately see it's a bit more involved than a PET or an Apple II. There are two separate card cages, one on either side. In the middle, under the monitor, is the power supply. At the back is the I.O. plane. And under all of that is an interconnecting motherboard. Back here, on the right side, is the analytical thinking componentry. On the left, you have all the I.O. and control gubbins, plus the memory. If I take out the six other screws around the base of the case, uh, you can hinge up the front case section. On the bottom of the front clamshell, in the middle, is the keyboard controller. On either side is a tape controller for each tape drive. The tape drives are worth a look. Curious Mark and others have dedicated videos to the repair of similar devices on the 9825 and 80 series computers, but it's still worth underlying just how clever these things are. HP came up with them before floppy disks got established as the universal removable storage format. In 1975 and 76, they created this elegantly simple and small design. Floppies are complicated beasts in comparison. The design is built around these mini cartridges called the DC-100. Those in turn were derived from the quick or quarter-inch tape cartridge. 3M marketed them as the DC-300. That was the cartridge IBM used in its 5100 series desktop computer in 1975. The 100 uses eighth-inch tape rather than the quarter-inch. The cartridge is about one-third the size. HP and 3M collaborated on the cartridge design, but the drive was purely HP's invention. It was introduced on the 2644 Terminal, 9825 Computer, and 9815 Calculator. The tape cartridge manages the distribution of force for the transport mechanism. The elastic band joining the reels and the driving roller helps maintain the tension and cushion the acceleration and deceleration of the mechanism. In effect, most of the wear and tear is on these replaceable components, rather than the drive. This tape mechanism only has one major moving component, the capstan. That sits on a motor with a tachometer feeding back to the control board. The read-write head is here next to it. These things are micro-switches. One is for write-protect sensing, and the other just senses whether the tape is present. And those gubbins are photo or IR sensing circuits. The ones at the back are looking for sequences of holes punched through the tape. Those indicate tape beginning and end. An infrared light shines up through the base of the tape, hits a mirror, and is sensed, or, or not, by the sensor at the back. There's a second set whose role appears to be to confirm the presence of a tape. The 9845 introduced a dedicated processor for this tape drive called the TACO. That's what's behind those heat sinks. Between the firmware and transport, HP's device is accurate enough to treat the tape as a block addressable device. You have to format the tapes just like a floppy. Once formatted, they can very rapidly shuttle around to find files. DEC popularized this block addressable tape idea with the DEC tape. That was back in the early 1960s. Let's move on to another innovative component. It's here at the start of the machine's main block. This is the printer. HP wrote whole articles promoting its technology. It's a full page width thermal printer. It prints a line of pixels at a time onto a thermal roll. It's based on thin film deposited resistors on a massive print bar with that heat sink hanging off the bottom of it. The only moving parts on it are its pinch rollers. Our working system soldiers on despite its age, we've not even replaced its drive belt. 
Next, at the center of it all, is this big metal plate. At the very heart of the machine, you have this elaborate power supply. It's like a puzzle box. It comes out of the central pocket as a kind of self-contained cube. All the cabling is on the captive plugs and edge connectors, so it just lifts out. What you get is the base plate, which is actually the top, with four boards that structurally support each other. The two side boards are structurally fixed by their edge connectors in the base. The front and back boards ride in these plastic runners. It's great, but famously painful to unpick for diagnostics. Ours has been recapped, of course. There are two separate card cages, one on either side. The machine sort of has two hemispheres to its silicon brain. On the right side is the analytical thinking componentry. On the left, you have all the I.O. and control gubbins, plus the memory. The 9845 is and isn't a microcomputer because its processor is and isn't a microprocessor. It's here on the first card on the right-hand side. HP called it a hybrid processor. It's one big package, but there are actually eight microchips inside the can on the same ceramic carrier. A similar processor package was used first in the 9825. It's also been used in the 9835 and the HP 250. Under the cooling fins and inside the metal package, you have the binary processor chip, or BPC, the EMC, or extended math chip, the address extension chip, and the IOC, or IO control chip. These all share an internal bus structure. At the bus edges, there are four buffers in pairs connecting the processor out to the system IO bus on one side and the memory on the other. The HP hybrid processor was a further evolution of the original HP 2100 series mini computers from the 1960s. The main chip containing the ALU is the BPC that provides all the core instructions and integer operations. It houses the HP Mini Computer's original standard A and B accumulators. The EMC is a math coprocessor equivalent and it adds a four register wide accumulator and a shift register. Now this model has the additional AEC chip. That's the address extension chip. The IO controller chip provides stack point and DMA control registers along with IO transfer registers and interrupt handling. The HP hybrid processor runs at 5.7 MHz. Next back from the processor is its LPU ROM and RAM board. This is where the core operating system lives. Now on this parts machine, you see a daughter card has been shoehorned in. Fact is, the ROMs used on these machines are given to BitRot. They're not pin compatible with any commercial products, so Ansgar Kukis came up with this ROM daughter board solution. Whatever is wrong with this machine, well, unfortunately that didn't solve it. So behind the ROM board is the printer controller. It's a computer all on its own with another custom HP processor. That's it there. It's an 8-bit device HP called the Nano Processor. This last device in the cage is an interconnect assembly bridging the underlying motherboard and this leg of the monitor. If we flip over to the machine's left side, the first three board slots are for RAM. There were a couple of different sizes. The first board on here in this Model B is usually a 128K. It's possible to fill all the slots with 512K boards instead, and that would give you a roughly 1.5 megabyte RAM total configuration. The RAM and ROM for the PPU are on the next card back. These devices are subject to bit rot, so you can see another piggyback board. Looking behind the RAM, well, does that look familiar? It's a second whole hybrid processor board. This is the PPU, or Peripheral Processing Unit. It's the same actual processor part as the LPU. This copy has its own dedicated RAM and ROM with a separate I.O. based operating system that cooperates with the language processor. There are more than just two processors. The system relies on intelligent device controllers to achieve maximum processing distribution. The tape drives, for instance, are controlled using high-level commands like tape forward, stop tape. All the low-level sensing and speed ramp logic is in a dedicated controller. The 9845 I.O. subsystem can support quite a large number of devices. This is partly due to the distributed processing approach, but the bus structure was also designed for high interconnectivity. The I.O. system has a dedicated bus separate from the processor and memory bus called the I.O.D. or I.O. device bus or I.O. data bus. A separate peripheral address bus or P.A.B. handles addressing. There are 16 possible I.O. device addresses. Four addresses are reserved for system devices, so there's a potential of 12 direct attached I.O. devices in addition to the internals. For a maximal configuration, each of those slots would have to be populated with an HPIB bus controller. That allows 15 device fanout for each of the 12 available I.O. bus slots. 
HPIB devices can also have sub addresses, typically up to four for something like a disk controller. So you could integrate a substantial process control environment, but even without that additional fan out, you could have 180 devices. This is the 9845 HPIB bus controller. It's also a small computer with an HP Nano processor in it. Back to the card cage. Digging a little further, you have text mode CRT logic. The graphics logic is in the actual CRT case. Underneath it all is a motherboard joining everything together. And last but not least are these two ROM drawers. One plugs into each side of the chassis. The ROMs extend the language capabilities of BASIC and add routines to the underlying I.O. processor's runtime. Each is keyed and color-coded to fit into only one set of slots. Some, like this extended graphics ROM, depend on additional hardware being present elsewhere. That brings us to the end of our little internal store. In our next video, we'll take the system out for a spin and try some of the software that you could run. Might even have sorted that screen fungus stuff, although that's a pretty big job. Thanks for joining us. Keep an eye out for that next video, and if you like this sort of thing, please like and subscribe. See you around.